co-hosts here. Um, it's uh, uh, it's kind of a, an honor and a privilege to give a Tassie lecture. I was myself a Tassie student in 1998 at a neutrino program that was um, organized primarily, I guess, by Paul Longacher. Um, and I um, have fond memories of that and hopefully um, this can be as good as it can be given the format being virtual now. Um, so uh, I put more time into preparing the slides than I probably had had to or should have uh, because it's kind of fun what you can do with animations uh, in uh, uh, communicating th across a screen and um, uh, also, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a challenge to try to be pedagogical that way. I'm partially in, inspired by three blue, one brown videos. If you ever check them out on YouTube, he's a mathematician that's very uh, adept at uh, pedagogy via YouTube. Um, he does uh, advanced topics, including group theory, um, abstract algebra. So. Um, and also, I've been lecturing uh, this past quarter, the entire a quarter using a Zoom. Uh, so some of the stuff uh, I developed, well, just methods I developed for that. Um, so uh, my task is to uh, talk to you about, and uh, hopefully uh, you learn something about neutrinos and astrophysics in the early universe. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that I've, I've gone from more pedagogical talks when I was a student in early postdoc uh, when I was first, uh, uh, you know, uh, myself uh, in the field to more qualitative talks in, uh, in later in life. So I've actually gone back to some of my early lectures uh, in, in, that have more pedagogical theme. Um, so uh, so first of all, uh, with, we're going to be talking about neutrinos. And of course, neutrinos are famous for their oscillations. And um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about this, but I'm going to reframe them in the format that I will be talking about for, uh, for neutrinos in astrophysical and cosmological systems. And um, let me make sure I can see the chat. I realized it's got hidden by my, by my window. OK. Um, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt, I guess. That's the format, as well as uh, drop a message in the chat. Uh, so uh, neutrino oscillations. Neutrino oscillations are uh, a very simple quantum system in the, in the end when you look at them as a two-flavor system. And really fits into you know, like you know, very basic aspects of it you can understand with quantum mechanics at the undergraduate level. Um, there it is. You've got two flavor states on the left, and you've got two uh, mass eigenstates on the right, and they are not the same states. They are um, different, different eigenstates, different uh, things, and you can transfer, um, transform from one, one to the other with a unitary transformation. And it's easy to do this kind of transformation in two, uh, in a two state system because, uh, well, you can use a, a mixing angle and sine and cosine functions to guarantee unitarity. And uh, there it is. Um, you've got a, uh, a two-state simple quantum system, right? So we're very familiar with this. Um, for an undergraduate, uh, you might think of, well, what's, what are mass eigenstates? Well, they're energy eigenstates, right? So those are the things that evolve in time and uh, that are easy to evolve in time uh, with, the, with the respect to Hamiltonian. So the thing that evolves with time are these mass energy eigenstates, and they evolve with the energy, uh, the time evolution operator, which looks like this. It depends on the total energy of the system. And uh, it's this that leads to neutrino oscillations, right? So uh, it evolves with time as um, uh, this operator, and the delta m squared that we're so familiar with in neutrino oscillations comes from taking the limit where this mass is small relative to its energy. And therefore, the, uh, the, the energy becomes uh, uh, proportional 1 plus m squared over 2k squared. And um, there's a relative phase that enters between the energy or mass eigenstates. 
in that relative phase goes as the difference of the mass squared, right? So uh, this is just to make you very comfortable with it. There's nothing very new yet that I'm talking about. Um, and there's a relative overall phase uh, here that uh, does not affect, of course, the, the evolution. Um, and it's only the, uh, uh, the overall phase is not affected, the relative phase does. So this is where neutrino oscillations come from. And uh, it's just saying that. And uh, it's simple to calculate. Again, this is just undergraduate quantum mechanics. You calculate the probability of finding a neutrino in a different flavor state in the future. You just take the inner product with that flavor state you're interested in, say nu alpha, and find uh, that inner product squared to get the probability. Uh, when you work that out, you get this relationship for a two flavor system where that sine squared two theta is the amplitude of the oscillation. It's not actually a phase, right? That actually that, that angle is the amplitude of the overall oscillation. And uh, the phase or uh, oscillation part of the neutrino oscillations comes from this delta m squared t over 4k. And when you put units in, it looks like this, right? And then uh, it's uh, what we're all very familiar with in neutrino phenomenology, or at least two neutrino phenomenology um, uh, for oscillations. Okay. And then you can be more explicit, put in the units in your favorite form and um, uh, have it as a phenomenological uh, formula. So more generally for N flavor states, things get more complicated, of course, you have not just a single um, uh, pair uh, and uh, you've got a unitary matrix, which could be N different uh, uh, mass eigenstates uh, with N different flavor eigenstates. And you might wonder, well, why, are there, why would there be N? Aren't there only three? Uh, well, you could also have non active states that don't couple to the standard model and therefore and still mix and those would be called sterile states and actually when i was a, a graduate student in 1998 we were working on kaluza klein models for neutrino mass uh, generation that produced an infinite tower of states and you had an infinite matrix here that uh, you had to use to to describe it and of course uh, if one sterile neutrino is bad probably um, uh, an infinite number of them are infinitely bad. So um, it turned out that they weren't infinitely bad, but they uh, had uh, features that had to be, uh, that were constrained by cosmology. So uh, once you start doing N neutrinos, then uh, the probability expression becomes a bit more complicated, right? It becomes um, uh, the like the following. You have to sum over all of the different uh, relevant matrix elements to get the oscillation physics uh, correct. And these are just neutrino, vacuum neutrino oscillations. So, um, so we're off and running and we're doing neutrino phenomenology here, at least vacuum neutrino phenomenology with this kind of formalism, okay? But this lecture isn't gonna be about neutrino phenomenology, uh, um, uh, really. It's gonna be about neutrino, say, astrophysics phenomenology and cosmology. Uh, so we'll talk about neutrinos in the early universe first because it's uh, uh, the simplest system. It is by far simpler than any astrophysical system because the universe is, a, uh, as you've probably uh, learned from the introduction of cosmology lectures is a homogeneous and isotropic place. And that makes uh, things very much easier relative to any astrophysical object, which is not going to be homogeneous and isotropic. At best, it is spherically symmetric. So uh, the early universe is a good place to first study neutrinos in terms of uh, the physics that could arise in dense environments. So what you have to do uh, beyond the vacuum oscillations we talked about is that you have to incorporate the fact that matter effects exist in, uh, in these systems and in, in the early universe. You're gonna have neutrinos colliding with themselves and with the background plasma. 
and you're gonna have uh, uh, forward scattering, meaning matter effects from the neutrinos themselves called active active forward scattering. So the, the neutrinos themselves see a background of neutrinos because you're in such a dense environment that you've thermally populated uh, the, the sea of neutrinos uh, present. And you've, these, all of these things are all, also relevant to astrophysical systems like um, just the sun, um, at least in, in terms of matter effects. And for more, even more dense systems like uh, compact objects and supernovae, you will have all of these things present as well. So in order to incorporate that, what one does and uh, what um, you have to do is do uh, use a structure called the density matrix. And this is what it looks like. And again, from undergraduate quantum mechanics, there's an operator here, uh, which is the density matrix operator. And uh, you project it into a chosen basis. Here are the alpha and beta bases, which are flavor state bases, uh, in to create a matrix within that basis. Okay. So um, I always get confused which of these is called the density matrix and which is called the matrix of densities. Um, I think this is the density matrix and this is the matrix of densities, meaning this is the actual matrix and this is the operator form. What does your equal sign with a dot mean? It just means represented as a matrix, I believe. I used that back in 2002 and I don't really remember what the, what the origin was. Um, uh, so the, um, uh, the, uh, density matrix operator here is, uh, is, uh, in abstract form is this, is this, right? This is, um, uh, project, this is using a certain projection, but of course this can be, um, uh, this can be projected into any kind of state that you want. For instance, you could write down the matrix of densities in the mass eigenstates. However, that usually is not useful because all of the interaction space that occurs uh, is happening in a flavor space, right? So both forward scattering, uh, hard scattering, and um, uh, matter effects are coming from flavor effects. So that's why you typically, or almost basically always, uh, projected into flavor states. So evolution of a density matrix um, basically gives all the quantities of interest uh, for what we're interested in in neutrino physics, which is the number densities of neutrinos of a given flavor. So in particular, uh, a property of the density matrix is the, the uh, diagonal components are proportional to the number densities of the relative flavors. And this is a interesting thing you you know this is this is um an inner uh, is a is a matrix element and not a, a probability right but the uh density matrix uh turns out to be the same as its square the uh the its trace squared is equal to itself so uh the diagonal elements are simply the actual density densities of the thing. And you could have one neutrino, therefore the density of one neutrino is always one. Um, but you could also normalize the whole thing by the density of the, uh, the system you're interested in. So um, the uh, density matrix uh, in the Schrodinger picture is some functional thing. And therefore you can time evolve it with what's called the von Neumann equation, which looks like this. Okay. And this is how often from first principles, you start with a neutrino system and evolve it into, uh, into the future uh, to see how a mixed system goes. This actually has a sign difference, by the way, with the Heisenberg time evolution equation, and uh, which looks like um, just the same thing with the minus sign, uh, but that's because we're in the Schrodinger picture here. And the, uh, it turns out that the density matrix in the Heisenberg time evolution time system is a, um, uh, the density matrix does not evolve in the uh, Heisenberg picture. Therefore it's consistent 
uh, with the Schrodinger picture. Okay, there was a question about what is the PJ in the density operator, right? That's, um, ah, way too far back. Um, so that's just the amplitude of, well, it is the value of the matrix um, uh, element in that, in the basis of, of J's. Um, so that's the diagonalized, uh, the eigenvalues in the psi J basis. But you have, um, Typically, you don't work with it there. You work with it in the in the in the flavor basis. All right. So, um, so here's the this is the time evolution that we deal deal with, and it's a sign difference in the Heisenberg relative to the Heisenberg time evolution equation, and um, that sign would. Uh, I'd often get confused by that in the literature because sometimes you'll see it one way and sometimes you'll see it another way. And it depends on whether they're talking about the density matrix evolution uh, in the Heisenberg uh, picture versus the Schrodinger picture. Uh, you can also uh, evolve the Schrodinger, uh, the, in the Schrodinger picture, the density matrix from time with the time evolution operator, right? It's a matrix, therefore, when you apply, when you want to evolve it in time, you, you do the time evolution operator on both sides. And um, so you get, uh, you get the following as a way of doing the evolution. So a lot of the literature starts from different places um, uh, to go from first principles of the density matrix to forward in time. Some start with this picture uh, with the von Neumann equation as it's called. Some um, evolve with time as, as uh, through this. A lot of times they don't even start here. They start from the, uh, what we'll see later, which is the um, structure of the density matrix in the polarization or uh, uh, precession picture. Um, so why the density matrix? As I said, it's, you really need uh, collisions and forward scattering by neutrinos themselves. Uh, to, to, that's why you do it, but it's also useful for other things. So we're getting our, ahead of ourselves because here I am talking about astrophysical systems when we haven't really defined the, the, the system in itself yet. Okay. So this is a two-state density matrix. Okay. Again, like we're doing two neutrino oscillations. And this two-state system has been studied in quantum mechanics since at least the 1950s. Uh, a two-state system that is, say, interacting with a thermal bath or is an optical system where you have polarization states. Uh, there, this has been studied for quite some time in, um, in condensed matter physics and, and atomic physics. And the uh, properties of the density matrix are, have, were well studied from that literature. And actually, that was what has been applied to neutrinos uh, density matrix themselves, right? So you can take a, uh, you can take what we've, that was learned there, and this was originally, I think, applied to neutrinos in the early universe in the 1980s um, by Leo Stodolsky uh, as a way of interpreting neutrino oscillations in dense environments. Um, so the reason that you do this, that you use the, uh, take the density matrix and think of it in terms of, uh, a, two, uh, of a geometric system is that gives you a good way to interpret what's going on with flavor states. So we can define a general mixed state with the density matrix uh, formalism as the following. Okay, so we've got some uh, general psi and it's a combination of uh, two uh, flavor states here. We're, now we're not talking about some flavor state decomposed into mass eigenstates. This, these are a, a mixed state of two different flavor states. And they can, in general, have some complex phase between them as well. 
And so uh, you can write down the complex phase with Euler formula in this way. Um, you uh, have a very general mixed state, right? And uh, when you look at that and you uh, interpret this as now uh, a system where it's uh, this theta has nothing to do, by the way, with the mixing angle. This is just how mixed the two flavor states are relative, uh, how much of the two different flavor states are in this mixed state. Um, you can actually think of this mixed state as a geometrical structure where uh, there's a vector whose position in uh, um, uh, 3D is given by the coordinates theta and phi in uh, uh, spherical coordinates, okay, relative to the z-axis and x-axis as, as typical with uh, spherical coordinates. Uh, I may have lost it too. Yes, I did. Um, uh, yeah, there should be theta over two. I was uh, debating whether to keep the theta or theta over two because in neutrino physics, the theta, the theta over two is sometimes redefined. Um, all right, so uh, um, right, so the, uh, basically this vector specifies a point in spherical coordinates and that vector is called P, typically like a polarization vector. Um, and uh, it is called the block vector and the sphere that it represents is it moves about is called the block sphere. Okay, and the vector has magnitude of, uh, of sine theta, cosine phi, sine theta, sine phi, and cosine theta. Okay, um, and here this is theta, uh, not it's not supposed to be theta over two. It actually is the the three D coordinates. And uh, and the, yeah, here again, this should be theta over two. There's a factor of two that that appears at some point at uh, some point uh, later that I that I'll, you'll see. So um, uh, so this is the general polarization vector. It basically uh, you can have a, a view of neutrinos through the system if you have a purely new alpha state, say that's new e or new mu or new tau. It's going to have its vector completely oriented in the z uh, direction, okay, um, and uh, that's uh, that's what it looks like, okay. That's a purely pure state, um, which is purely new alpha, okay. And you can also have a completely new beta state. Of course, that would look like the opposite, pointing downwards, okay. And um, a general mixed state would have the polarization vector, of course, in some arbitrary direction. Okay, so this is what we mean by this polarization vector for neutrino states. It's a mixed system, uh, uh, a representation of the complex phase and mixing of the system. So if we go back to the density matrix from this structure uh, uh, of the P state and then write down this density matrix in the formulation, in, in the mixed state, uh, structure that we just that we just developed we can write it in terms of this p block vector okay and basically you know sandwiching this uh this matrix in terms of uh in terms of the mixed states that we just wrote down before the sine sine data cosine data um, and complex phase uh systems uh, evaluating it out that way, you get uh, the rel those phases on the right-hand side, uh, that you get the angles and their magnitudes, and then you see that there is, um, I'm not going to go through the uh, algebra, but basically what comes out is that the diagonal elements depend on the z magnitude of the polarization vector, and um, uh, so those that gives you, as you would think, the total num uh, number density in one flavor versus the other, um, up or down. So if it's a negative negative magnitude, you would have more in the beta flavor, and a positive magnitude, you would have more in the alpha flavor, just as we saw before. And then the mixed uh, state quantities would be represented by the x and y amplitudes of the polarization vector, okay, or block vector. Uh, you mentioned that a theta equals pi corresponds to psi. 
Uh, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, good question. What is P naught? So if we were talking about one neutrino, uh, P naught would be one. Okay. Um, so that would be one neutrino. But typically you can extend this to arbitrary numbers of neutrinos. And um, uh, so you can uh, think of the normalization as the total number density of neutrinos as opposed to uh, one, a number density of one. Um, so that's P naught uh, represents the total number density of both flavor states of neutrinos. Sine pi zero, so psi would be minus nu alpha. Um, yeah, I might have a sign error, uh, uh, but the theta of pi corresponds to, um, uh, yeah, I, may, I might have my my uh, my uh, sine and cosine switched on that, but I, but. Uh, Certainly it corresponds to one flavor state uh, pointing up and another flavor state pointing down, right? Um, okay, so, um, so it, turns out, um, it turns out that uh, the structure of this matrix uh, represents uh, the P vector being dot products with uh, the poly spin matrices. And so the P's, um, um, uh, are you know the, the the structure of the of the uh, of the density matrix has this kind of uh, familiarity with the spin matrices, uh, again arising from the two state system. So uh, so let's go back to the time evolution of the density matrix uh, of, from this equation, and you can take uh, its evolution that way. And we should recover vacuum oscillations um, um, uh, with probability densities evolving as the following. Uh, yeah, that theta versus theta over two, it's gonna come up again. So if I, I might've messed it up on earlier slides, but basically it, it's correct in later slides. Um, uh, so anyway, so we should recover uh, vacuum oscillations. Vacuum oscillations, of course, should be the simplest possible thing to consider uh, in the density matrix. Uh, formulation. So we should get this formula again for uh, vacuum oscillations from the density matrix formulation. So uh, time evolution uh, basically becomes this, uh, this equation. Uh, and again, I'm not going to derive it. Um, uh, it's uh, in the literature from the early, from the 80s. Um, and uh, basically it causes the P vectors for a given momentum state to, um, uh, to uh, process about a uh, magnetic field or, um, or a, another vector V that, uh, d that, that um, uh, governs its evolution. So the, the, the P vectors uh, basically a, is a processing system uh, like field uh, or a dipole in a magnetic field or a spin uh, system in a magnetic field. So if you have a mixed state uh, in uh, a neutrino state, you have a P vector that's gonna live on the X, Z plane. And the, uh, um, well, it actually could be anywhere. The V vector would be in the P, uh, X, Z plane. And, uh, but in general, you could even have the V vector extend out into any direction. And the P vector basically would be something that processes about this in the usual way. Um, so again, this is equivalent to spin precession. So we're again talking about undergraduate quantum mechanics. Um, so um, that's what happens with the evolution of a system in a, uh, uh, of a density matrix system in, in this way. Okay, so how does that work? Let's talk about vacuum oscillations. So the potential in the case of vacuum oscillations is given by the delta function, which um, is the usual de delta m squared over 2e. I think I didn't write that here. Uh, there it is. Um, delta m squared over 2e or 2p is the overall uh, quantity that, that of course governs uh, neutrino oscillations in vacuum. And um, 
the orientation of that vector is that it has an X component and a Z component. And um, that's what things process about. That's what the flavor state processes about in vacuum. So that actually looks something like this, for instance, for maximal neutrino oscillations, um, the, uh, um, the uh, orientation of the V vector is along the Z axis, okay? And um, um, sorry, along the X axis, it has no Z orientation. And here we're again talking, uh, talking about the mixing angle and not the theta angle of the spherical coordinate system. So, so for a 45 degree mixing, you have an orientation along the Z axis and the P vector uh, processes about that. Okay. So you can uh, produce a purely uh, say new mu state in the atmosphere and it would oscillate uh, about the V vector um, in this way. Um, okay. But in general, it will uh, process uh, like that. Okay. So we have, um, uh, that for maximal mixing, it looks like that, slightly out of order. Uh, but basically this is recovering uh, the vacuum oscillation picture by showing this, um, by uh, this P going about the V vector in the Z Y plane, if it's uh, originally oh, purely along the Z. Okay. So um, Let's talk about matter effects, all right? So this is the why we even brought it in. Uh, and actually we're gonna have to talk about uh, neutrino, neutrino self matter effects. Uh, neutrinos propagating through space are dressed by loop diagrams, okay? Um, and uh, that's uh, generally the case for any particle, right? But uh, those become important um, in finite density, right? So, um, in general, a uh, neutrino state uh, can have a bubble diagram dressing, dressing it, or uh, you could have this kind of tadpole diagram uh, dressing a neutrino propagator. Okay. And um, uh, in vacuum and zero temperature, of course, these vanish, and, but in matter and at high temperatures, they have significant contributions that have to be included. And uh, this is often called forward scattering of neutrinos. Uh, through the commonality with photon force scattering. Uh, and that's, it's not really the same thing other than the fact that the momentum doesn't change or wave number doesn't change through the scattering. Um, and in fact, that is only the true, true for um, matter affected forward scattering. In neutrino self scattering, forward scattering, you do swap momentum of the neutrinos, which causes the very weird behavior of uh, neutrino self forward scattering. So, um, so this is uh, the origin of matter effects. Both of them uh, contribute in finite density environments. So both the bubble diagram and the tadpole diagram are, are uh, con contribute when you have a background of finite density, say the sun or supernova or the early universe with um, uh, the presence of um, uh, asymmetric backgrounds that could exist, say, with uh, neutrino asymmetries and the small, uh, but often sometimes non-negligible um, uh, uh, um, um, baryon asymmetry, right, which exists then. So, um, so the bubble diagrams uh, contribute uh, to the effects of finite temperature or plasma backgrounds, okay? So um, these are the only ones that contribute to the finite temperature effects. Okay. Where does the background come in the loop Feynman diagram? It comes through this propagator here. Yeah. Can it be dense matter and zero temperature? Yes, um, it could be. So effectively the sun is zero temperature for the neutrinos. Um, they're not, um, they're not in uh, um, the finite temperature effects are negligible even at a million Kelvin. Um, so, yeah. How is the propagator sensitive to the background? Um, uh, so, I guess the, the when you loop when you uh, integrate over the momenta of the potential states, the 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 
the uh, background number density comes in through through that. Um, I don't have the, the the formalism in the lecture here, but it, it does it comes through integrating over all the possible momenta of the um, of the uh, of the loop here. Yeah. Um, Um, I guess it's the, the possible states that exist in the loop uh, are affected by the background. Um, so they, they uh, uh, contribute, um, uh, they contribute flavor dependent background potential to the neutrino evolution. Um, and therefore they uh, are oriented in the Z axis of the P vector system. Okay. So do the tadpoles contribute here? Yeah. Right, so this is the tadpole that contributes. So this, this contributes to finite density, and this contributes to finite density, but the only one that contributes to finite temperature is the bubble diagram. Yeah. So the tadpoles contribute to density, bubble diagrams contribute to density, uh, but temperature is only, if, only uh, in the bubble uh, diagram. So that's, I mean, so that's why it's, um, uh, yeah, this, this is, uh, um, that's where it's coming from. And I guess the finite density is coming from, um, from the possibility of producing this uh, in a background, right? So you're, you've got basically Fermi, Fermi effects from the possibilities of including this in the tadpole. Yeah. yeah why is the tadpole not present for finite T? There's a cancellation um, uh, due to that, um, uh, that in that case, yeah. Um, I guess the latest paper where uh, that is of my own that's this is this is worked out at some level is the one with Teja Venumadov um, as the first author. So, uh, and me, I forget which where I am in the authors list, but uh, this is back in 2015. Um, all right, so what you get for the background, uh, the background contribution is, is actually just only due to an asymmetric background, okay? So if, uh, if you have active sterile mixing, the, the sterols don't interact with anything, therefore um, even the, the, uh, um, the Z contribution uh, comes in here with the, num the, uh, the background of nucleons in a system. Uh, however, for active-active mixing, it's only um, the presence of electron neutrinos. And if, if you're in somehow in some system that's a muon bath, of course, it would be non-zero non uh, for this case. Uh, but in astrophysical and early universe systems um, really only have um, asymmetries in uh, the electron flavors and baryons, of course. Um, so uh, this is what it looks like for the uh, background potential again, and this is what it looks like for the uh, finite temperature potential. Okay, and then the, fi the finite temperature potential depends on um, the presence of uh, the neutrinos themselves, okay, as well as the presence of uh, the charged leptons that the neutrinos are mixing with. Okay, and uh, it's a sum. And so that's just always there. It doesn't get canceled from, um, uh, from the fact that it's a symmetric background. For instance, in the early universe, um, it's uh, entirely symmetric uh, in terms of uh, electron neutrinos or uh, mu and tau leptons. Um, electron, electrons are slightly asymmetric to, uh, to, be, uh, to cancel off of the um, uh, the um, uh, the charge of the protons, but the um, uh, uh, yeah, so the only asymmetry exists from from um, um, uh, electron neutrinos. I guess I was uh, going to say something else, but basically, yeah, you could also have um, you could have asymmetries in the neutrinos, and that could actually also affect 
the um, thermal potential as well as the macron potential. Um, so that isn't that actually isn't included in this formulation. Okay. Um, so you could you could you do need to sum up over any potential asymmetries in the neutrinos in this in this potential. Okay. So um, so this is where it comes in. It comes in as I as mentioned because it's a flavor effect. It only enters in the z-axis. Okay. And uh, that's relevant because then it's going to affect how things behave with respect to the the vacuum effects in a specific way. So if you have a very high asymmetry uh, in the background, such as in the interior of the sun, the potential spins, uh, the potential pins precession about the z-axis, okay? So, um, and if it's born in a, in a flavor state that's close to that z-axis, as you've defined it to be something there, then the, it just doesn't evolve. The neutrino is just fixed in flavor uh, uh, into that, uh, that state, okay? And that is what happens with MSW. It's, it's born in some one state, pinned to a flavor, and doesn't really evolve. And um, so that's uh, that's where where this term will be dominating over in the in the um, in the system. Okay. Similarly, for high temperature backgrounds, the potential pins the flavor uh, spins pins precession to the z-axis. So. Uh, Finite temperature potential in the early universe, even if you have no asymmetry, pins the, the neutrino evolution to be uh, fixed in its flavor states. Again, they're born in flavor states because they're born out of collisions through pair production um, and or scattering. Um, um, and so they have a given flavor state and with a very high thermal potential, they're just, they're just stuck in that state, whatever state they're born at. Um, however, uh, you've got uh, a possibility for vacuum oscillations still taking over. So you will, at some point, say if you have high asymmetry density and small mixing, um, uh, well, high, high asymmetry density, you have small mixing because effectively your uh, precession vector, if this was the vacuum term, you're basically saying that there's just no, the theta is, is zero. There's no mixing of the states. You, you're, you're stuck about a given flavor state and the P is pinned to the z-axis. In vacuum, the V is, is just the delta and the delta has some orientation in the X, Z plane, depending on how mixed the two flavor states are. So that's what it looks like, okay. Uh, for in general, for high symmetry densities and vacuum. And MSW, and I'm uh, uh, not covering MSW today in detail, but MS, the uh, MSW effect responsible for what's going on in the sun is simply the density evolving to go from high density to low density as a neutrino propagates. And it goes from uh, what is a given flavor state to, uh, uh, it goes adiabatically from this state to a new state. And in fact, the new state is is oriented completely opposite, so that you go from one flavor state entirely purely in the sun, uh, which is electron, to a new flavor state, and you can think of it as a just a mu tau superposition. This orientation of the vector, actually, for MSW, and I didn't draw this, but the orientation of the v vector is down, so the flavor completely gets swapped in MSW. Okay. Um, and, uh, and again, the delta is given by the mixing of the neutrino, um, the mixing angle. Okay. Well, there's a new question here. Um, will the curved, will the curved space time affect this? Uh, so not for uh, neutrinos in the early universe uh, in, in any substantial way because their, their uh, optical depth is very small relative to the horizon size. Um, However, uh, for neutrinos propagating from the last scattering of neutrinos to today, curved space time will affect things. Um, and uh, right, so you could actually have a, a high asymmetry density uh, and maximal mixing uh, through this, this picture. So um, one thing that can happen 
is that um, as you enter resonance. So resonance is the evolution from that, the V vector moving from up, the up orientation as we had it before to this orientation and then further. But that is basically the sweeping of the mixing angle from small to maximal and then to its vacuum value. And, va and the maximal occurs when, so for the, the, the for the sun, the thermal potential doesn't exist. However, for uh, it does exist that the background potential is there and the background potential can cancel out this Z term, okay? And so um, uh, that's when you get a, a, maxima, a, a maximum mixing for um, uh, in, in a resonance of the, of the MSW effect, okay? Uh, so since the background potential is only affects the axis orientations of the potential, okay, then it can be subsumed in an effective mixing angle, okay? So instead of thinking of this V as, as some separate, as some combination of uh, the vacuum mixing plus some matter effects, you can just put all the matter effects in a new delta, okay? And so you can call that new delta the matter affected delta that has some matter affected mixing angle. And this is done routinely in, in uh, neutrino astrophysics. And um, uh, so that's uh, basically you're just saying V is some delta, some new delta. So um, in that, that new delta has its own orientation in the, in the, in the vector space and um, uh, and the matter, the relative to the vacuum mixing angles and vacuum and the backgrounds that contribute, it looks like this. Okay, so the sine two theta uh, matter affected is a odd combination. It's just the basically the diagonalization of or the uh, 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 combination of what's going on in the polarization vector. Um, once you add the background and, and thermal potentials. Okay, so for the sun, of course, the thermal effects aren't there, but this does enter and you have uh, this matter affected mixing angle. And you can see how resonances occur uh, because this can cancel. In fact, in the early universe, you can get two resonances where this vacuum term cancels the background as well as the thermal potential. Okay. The diagram one on the right for vacuum. Uh, let me go back. Um, yeah, this could be for vacuum um, with maximal mixing, uh, or it could you could you know in, in the way that in the fact that the V could just be the delta in the vacuum and that's maximal. Um, however, you can also get maximal mixing um, through resonance when the when the VB cancels the delta cosine two theta term. And um, so this mixing angle becomes, becomes uh, maximal. But roughly what T scale does do finite temperature effects become important? Um, it, it depends on, uh, it depends on what, what you're interested in, but uh, effectively they become important uh, when uh, in the early universe when you populate the uh, electron background as well as electron positron background as well as the neutrino background which comes for free at about uh, at uh, uh, very very uh, at the same time basically so we're talking at a temperature of about 5 MeV it's there um, now where, do, where does it become important in terms of dynamics uh, depends on which which dynamics you're interested in um, and so uh, it becomes particularly important at very high temperatures, so above a, um, 100 MeV or so, then the thermal potential really changes. So it really depends on the, the scale between the thermal potential and the delta. So if you have a small delta, you can have a, it, it's at lower temperatures. So say the mass splitting between the E and mu, most E and most mu states. Um, or one and two states, uh, it, the thermal potential is more important for these small splittings. For large sp splittings, like say GeV sterile neutrinos or KeV sterile neutrinos, the thermal potential has to be 
or the thermal effects have to be bigger in order to have uh, relatively larger effects. So for uh, KEV scale sterile neutrinos, which I'll talk about, I think, next time, um, uh, the thermal potential starts dominating at uh, above about 130 uh, MeV, 100 to, to 200 MeV. Um, so let's, uh, the first thing we can do in terms of knowing what this matter affected mixing is, is uh, the fact, we haven't talked about collisions, but we can just set aside how collisions go into the density matrix eventually. And collisions are weird because, you know, the density matrix, we had it uh, preserve number, but collisions can change number, right? Um, um, but uh, they, can, they can also be subdominant. So you basically are just looking at the probability of a neutrino being an active state versus a sterile state is proportional to that mixing angle, okay? The matter affecting mixing angle, and uh, it will be uh, it will uh, interact at a rate which is the neutrino interaction rate, which goes as g Fermi squared p t to the fourth, or basically t to the five here. Um, that's the total interaction rate, so it goes as um, uh, a number density as well as an energy that goes as eventually to t to the five. And delta squared, remember, is delta m squared over two p squared. Uh, so it goes as inverse p squared and inverse t squared as a result. And this, that appears downstairs as well, the delta squared. Uh, but And then the thermal potential goes as t to the 5. And with that quantity squared, it goes as t to the 10 in the early universe. And um, whenever you want to calculate something in the early universe, uh, it uh, always is worth paying attention to what's going on relative to some interaction rate relative to the Hubble rate. So the interaction rate is slower, uh, much slower than the Hubble expansion rate. Uh, the particles will not see each other uh, before the Hubble, the, before the universe expands. And, um, and um, it's also, again, just to uh, highlight again, this is, this allows for resonances to occur. So you can have very uh, high, uh, production rates of, of sterile neutrinos due to resonant effects. And this is important for dark matter production. Um, okay, so the basic thing though, is that at some point this uh, gamma over H is dominated by the thermal potential at high temperature and um, it goes down as T to the minus nine when you take the ratio with H and uh, at low temperature, the thermal potential goes away and all you have is T to five, the delta squared cancels on the top and bottom. And um, relative to H, which just goes as T squared, this goes as T cubed at low temperature. So it's a peaked function. It's gonna peak at some point, uh, at some temperature where you have maximum production of, of sterile neutrinos. And that depends on the neutrino mass um, because it depends on where, uh, um, um, where, th where things uh, 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 peak, and it's uh, roughly at a 10 MeV for uh, the type of uh, short baseline scales that people are interested in, 10 MeV to say 100 MeV, and uh, higher for KeV scale neutrinos. So one basic thing though is if you have gamma over H of greater than one, and you can easily solve for what that is, um, because you, have, you know what the whole expansion rate is at a given temperature, and you know what the neutrino interactions are, um, what their rate is because of just thermal physics, um, you will get thermalization. And this was a basic result of neutrino physics for sterile neutrinos and uh, plays into uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Okay, so uh, why this plays into it is that um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, this is a the reaction network from the old uh, Fowler, Wagner, and Hoyle code. Turns out that not much of it is that important except for this end because of uh, uh, the baryon asymmetry of the universe is fairly low, so you don't get to produce much heavy things or many at all. Um, the only things that you produce of measurable quantity are helium at about 25% of the mass fraction of the universe and uh, deuterium at uh, um, 10 to the minus four relative to the hydrogen. Uh, or a few times to the minus five at the baryon densities we're interested in. 
some helium three is produced, but that's destroyed by stars. Stars, so it's very it's very hard to measure. Um, and lithium, and um, is also produced. So it's just things just hang around down here in big magnetosynthesis. These new reaction rates. Uh, so uh, some of the first projects I ever did were actually using this code. I actually converted the Wagner Fowler and Hoyle code to a Mathematica code at one point. It was very buggy, um, but uh, you can. Uh, uh, it's possible to do that because it's just a set of differential reaction network, reaction equations, differential equations. So uh, what happens in, uh, in cosmic, in, in BVN is actually just a very basic thing with respect to neutrino physics. So again, the Hubble expansion goes as T, um, uh, T squared or the density of everything to the square root, okay? And by the density of everything, that's really literally everything, photons, electron, positron, background, the other neutrinos, and any extra sterile neutrinos. And they will get thermalized if gamma over H is greater than one. And um, you have to have enough of a mixing angle in order to produce that, that gamma over H. And it also depends on the delta, of course, in that mixing angle, the delta squared. Um, and it, this is a competition between another gamma over H. And the gamma here is the weak interaction rate gamma. And uh, the proton to neutron and neutron to proton rates are shown here. Neutron to proton are cyan and magenta is proton to neutron. And what happens is that you have very free interconversions of neutrons and protons at about ab above about an MeV. And uh, uh, so the relative abundance of neutrons and protons is just given by the Boltzmann factor that is the difference of their masses because they're in thermal equilibrium. They're just quickly interacting with or converting between the other. So that Boltzmann factor uh, changes, it goes as uh, e to the minus delta mnp over t, okay? And so as the temperature goes down, the difference between uh, the number densities of neutrons and protons increases. And um, at if you were to increase the Hubble rate due to the presence of sterile neutrinos, then this line goes up or down as shown here. And so you basically will have, uh, if you have a Hubble rate that is, uh, there's the punchline. If you have a Hubble rate that's higher, then you'll have a closer neutron to proton ratio. And that means you'll have more neutrons uh, because it, it, um, the neutrons are the more massive thing. So you have less of them and uh, uh, all of the neutrons get incorporated in helium. So if you have more neutrons, you get more helium. And uh, there's, there are observations of the density of helium uh, astronomically uh, from very low metallicity systems where it should be close to primordial. Helium, of course, is created in stars. But if you look at uh, low metallicity systems, you should get to a very low metallicity, uh, very uh, close to primordial value of the, the helium abundance. And the presence of um, that constraint basically means that you cannot arbitrarily increase this, this Hubble rate uh, to high values and therefore exceed the observed helium abundance. And the constraints, uh, PDG 2020 constraints are still those that came about more than about five years ago uh, that were in this uh, review of modern physics. Um, and uh, basically BBN constraints, the helium abundance constraints, the number of neutrinos be between 2.3 and 3.4 that are thermalized at Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which again, starts at about one MeV in temperature. So this was uh, this gamma over H being greater than one for matter affected mixing, oops, um, is, so this quantity of gamma over H being greater than one, being a guide stone or hallmark for uh, for you know not good things happening in the in the early universe uh, with the production of or thermalization of sterile neutrinos. Um, well, this was actually pointed out, and Paul Longacker uh, uh, he um, he organized the meeting uh, Tazzy that I was at, at in 1998. Uh, 11 years or nine years before that, he uh, was the first to point out that uh, you would get equilibrium of sterile neutrinos above this line in, um, 
in the mix, mass mixing mix uh, space. Okay, and in fact, it's it's a uh, go, continues, but there are um, other things that happen like pion production up here. So um, uh, all of these signals that could be due to active sterile mixing, for instance, the large mixing angle solution for the sun. Uh, before we had uh, evidence for it being active, purely active, active, uh, he showed could not be um, uh, due to active sterile mixing uh, in the early universe and uh, potentially destroying the, the agreement of helium with Big Bang nucleosynthesis. What's remarkable about this result to me and from 1989 is that this paper where this plot appears and this result appears, which is so fundamental to all of to neutrino cosmology, um, was unpublished uh, because there were some concerns by, apparently by the uh, referee about what this would do in supernovae. Um, and, you know, Paul said that this has nothing to do with supernovae. I'm just talking about, 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 um, about the early universe. And so, you know, this article continued unpublished, but the preprint's available. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes your uh, very important work and groundbreaking work is not published. Um, which is, uh, uh, you know, part of life, I guess, as a physicist, right? Um, Paul did fine anyway, right? So, um, so let's talk about the neutrino cell potential. And I, that, uh, you know, I really didn't know how fast this would go. Uh, so I've got uh, a good bit about neutrino cell potential here, and we'll continue next time um, as uh, as needed. Um, so um, I am supposed to co cover the full hour and 15 minutes, right? Or is there supposed to be discussion time? Um, you can keep going if you want. I mean, we'll, we've had a bunch of questions as we go. So um, okay. yeah. yeah, just making sure I didn't, I didn't misread what to do. Okay. You're good um, till noon. What's that? You're good till noon. Okay, great. Okay. I'll, um, I'll continue then. So let's talk about the neutrino self potential. So this is, uh, this is uh, something very weird uh, in terms of matter effects anyway. It's not like the usual, you get an asymmetry and or even the thermal effects where it's all pinned to the z-axis. Things are no longer pinned to the z-axis in, in, the, in the self potential world. Um, because when you have alpha, say two neutrinos that mix with each other, you can have this interaction, right? So you have one neutrino flavor and another neutrino flavor, and um, uh, they have momentum Q, momentum P, and the alpha neutrino can take the momentum P, and the beta neutrino can take the momentum Q. So you start mixing momentum modes, and it turns out that the uh, uh, evolution of a given flavor of neutrino depends on the entire population of other neutrinos in the background, because you have to integrate over the entire background. Okay, so a given neutrino depends on the, the, all of the other neutrinos backgrounds. And so the, the uh, fact that this uh, causes a, a, a mixing between uh, neutrino flavor states uh, causes the potential to have an arbitrary orientation. The self potential can have an arbitrary uh, orientation in, um, in the vector space. It's not no longer pinned to the z-axis. And so, in fact, it, it has to do with the total number density uh, of neutrinos um, uh, in a um, uh, relative, you know, of active neutrinos versus an, uh, anti-neutrinos, okay? So it only occurs um, uh, yes, it's only mediated by the z, right? Um, so this occurs, uh, uh, the, the self potential really occurs when you have an asymmetry in flavor uh, in active neutrinos relative to anti-neutrinos. So, um, uh, but you can all have a very small asymmetry and it would actually have a big effect because of the fact that the, um, the J is so dominant in the evolution of, of things, okay? So what is the J vector? The J vector, because you're having to sum over everything, is the sum over all of the possible momenta of all of the other uh, neutrinos that are in the background, right? As you say, you can, you can scatter off of anything in the background. And so you have to sum over the active neutrinos, P vectors, 
and the, the anti-neutrinos p vectors because um, of uh, uh, from symmetry it comes out that you have to have uh, you use some over those as well. Okay. So uh, if you take uh, the matter affected potential uh, as A, and this is just the convention that was started in self potential stuff, and um, uh, it uh, is uh, not V anymore, but basically effectively the same thing as what as V that we talked about before. So the polarization vector for the neutrinos uh, follows V cross P as before, and for anti neutrinos, uh, due to the matter uh, antimatter asymmetry, is just a minus sign on that vector. Okay, and, the, and so that goes as a p bar. And so you actually, for if you have an asymmetry in neutrinos and antineutrinos, um, the, uh, uh, the self potential arises as, as contributing to things and it, it affects both the neutrinos and the antineutrinos. So you have to calculate both at the same time, at the, in, for instance, in the early universe. And the self potential is just some constant as from before in this asymmetry. And remember the J's are sums of the, uh, of the moment of the polarization vectors of the other, all the other states. And um, you can actually think of this J minus J bar as a new vector that you're processing about, right? Uh, which is um, say I, and then you have some effective uh, um, uh, effective th uh, thing that is processing about the J. And the reason that we, we process about this as opposed to the other way around is that the I, um, the I is the dominant uh, uh, vector in the system. Basically, they, it, um, it's, the, it's greater in magnitude. And so <clears throat> this effective, A effective is uh, the A sub P is the matter affected potential uh, 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 combined with the uh, polarization vectors of the, of the system. Okay. And these are in the, just in the Z direction. So you can write it down as just a simple product, right? Because of the system. So what that means is you've got a, uh, a matter affected potential, which is this thing that is usually pinned to the Z axis, for instance, from thermal effects. And then you have an I vector, which is the difference between the asymmetries, uh, the difference between the neutrinos and antineutrinos, and therefore just from any asymmetry in the system. And the P's like to process about the I because it dominates. I is, is uh, um, like, uh, no, like several orders of magnitude bigger than A. So this is not to scale. So really the A is just a small perturbation uh, on the, for the P's, um, they really like to process about I, okay? So matter of fact is, is negligible. It's like a factor of a million, for instance, in certain systems, um, smaller than uh, the self potential. And so, so the, everything, all the neutrinos like to just go around the asymmetry vector. Um, however, the dynamics is such that the, um, uh, P, the P vector is uh, uh, the dynamics is such that the uh, whole system is actually going to follow the A vector in the end. And this was first uh, uh, solved by uh, uh, several of us back in 2002. It was originally found numerically by Dolgov and company uh, early in 2002. And then the uh, dynamics of it in terms of polarization systems is, uh, was worked out by Yvonne Wong and then uh, myself and John Beacom and Nicole Bell, uh, the three of us were at Fermilab. Um, and this is an old problem, but it's just a really beautiful one in terms of neutrino uh, cells, uh, dynamics in high density systems. And uh, that's why I like to, and it gives you a flavor for the kind of different kind of uh, self potential dynamics that occurs and it's a lot more can occur in supernova systems that, that has been worked out. But this one's um, uh, uh, near and dear because it actually is interesting in terms of the, 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 the physics of it, but also completely changes our understanding of big bang nucleus synthesis which, synthesis, which I'll get to. So in this system, again, we've got, uh, if you ignore the self potential, remember there was the J minus J bar terms, we've dropped those 
the matter effective potential again is just delta in the thermal potential. The background uh, due to uh, matter uh, asymmetry is very small, so it's just ignored. And so A sub P uh, is this system in the x direction of of the of the um, polarization vector uh, goes as two theta, the mixing angle, uh, and that basically just goes as dx over uh, the the thermal potential, meaning your polarization vector is pinned to uh, the z-axis and has very small x orientation at high temperature, okay, just as before. So and the mixing angle um, tells you where you will wind up uh, uh, for your a vector, and here it's minus just for sign convention. But basically, if you have maximal mixing, uh, and the orientation here is a slightly different from earlier, x is over here and y is here, the A, the potential will go from very much close to uh, uh, the Z axis down to oriented along the X axis for maximal mixing. So that is the dynamics if you ignore the self potential. It turns out it's um, um, the same dynamics when you include the self potential for weird reasons. So in order to get uh, a mixing of flavors uh, or reset of, of any asymmetries, you have to have this large mixing angle. So the atmospheric <clears throat> large mixing angle plus the large mixing angle solution to the solar neutrino problem is exactly the cause why we cannot have large asymmetries in the early universe. Um, collectively, uh, the system goes as this, as which I wrote before. And if you say that originally they start off very close to each other, which is safe because you're you're forced into that system, um, into uh, orientation of the, both the potential and the P vectors early on due to high temperature. Um, it turns out that this effective potential uh, follows a synchronization delta. So again, instead of, instead of orienting uh, into, in, instead of calculating a uh, matter effective mixing angle, you can calculate a synchronization mixing angle. And that mi synchronization mixing angle uh, has a fixed momentum over temperature that it follows, and that's pi, which is totally crazy. And chi here is the is the um, asymmetry uh, uh, chemical potential of the neutrinos, and it's typically smaller than uh, the square root of two pi. And um, so this is typically small. So it's effectively about pi that the synchronization momentum over temperature follows. Okay. Why this is crazy is that if you were just to look at what happens, if what, what momentum over temperature a, a Fermi Dirac distribution follows, it's about 3.15. And so uh, the momentum modes of all of the neutrinos in the early universe, if you have an asymmetric background, that is you have some asymmetry between neutrinos and asymmetric neutrinos, follow uh, the neutrino that is going, that is, um, has a momentum of pi, okay? which is the neutrino that is in this momentum over temperature. And this angle is the angle of the A, A potential uh, vector in this case. And this is the angle of the P polarization vectors in this case. So the P polarization vectors just happen to follow the momentum mode of pi all together. Okay, that's synchronization. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of cool. Uh, why this is important, and I'll talk about this next time because we're about a minute over, but basically uh, you can no longer have large asymmetries. Um, if you have high electron neutrino asymmetry and high muon neutrino asymmetry, um, you could have uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis succeed in all of its elemental abundances with crazy large asymmetries in neutrino flavor. So we'll talk about that more next time. Okay, great. Um, we have some time for other questions. If people have additional questions, uh, please type them in the chat. Let's wait a little while so people can have time to type. Sure. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing 
anything much coming up? Well, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, here's something. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, so we can relate the constraint on the neutrino asymmetry to leptogenesis slash baryogenesis? Yeah, so I haven't talked about uh, leptogenesis or baryogenesis, but um, you would have to have a mechanism that produces a large uh, lepton asymmetry in order for there to be an asymmetric background. Um, and uh, that does exist in certain models of leptogenesis. Um, uh, uh, these um, resonant leptogenesis models that are out there. Um, you could also have it uh, um, in Affleck-Dine uh, models. I understand, although I have not looked at those as much. So, so in what I guess when you're talking about a large neutrino asymmetry, this would be an intrinsic lepton number asymmetry. Right. Separate from the bear, like, I mean, because the neutrino bath is essentially still a thermal bath, right? Right. Yeah. It's a Even thermal today. bath. You would have yeah. chemical potential giving an asymmetry. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Because the neutrinos froze out like before Big Bang nucleosynthesis, I think. Is that true? Yeah. Just before. Just before. About 5 um, MeV. Right. So, so this this would have to not get translated, this would have to not get equilibrated with the baryon asymmetry, otherwise we're, we're toast, right? Right, so you have to avoid sphaleron uh, reconversion of the, le of the lepton to asymmetry. So you'd have to have uh, leptogenesis uh, occur like very close to, um, at low scale, um, but below the sphaleron transition or close to it. Okay. Oh, okay. But there's tons of room. I mean, you know, that's like... There's ways to do it. It's kind of, it's kind of fine-tuned, um, but there are okay. ways to do it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah, this ties in a little bit to something that um, I guess Lisa, maybe Andre was, yeah, Andre was talking about yesterday about um, the, the U1 baryon and the U1 lepton um, being apparently accidental global symmetries of the standard model, but they're both anomalous and U1 B minus L is unbroken. But this is the anomaly, I guess, depends on the weak interactions. And so once you're below that scale, then they, they sort of are separately conserved, I guess. Right. Sorry, I'm just free associating here. Yeah. That's right. yeah. And, and the kind of phenomenologically, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's just interesting to think about what is the possible largest asymmetries that exist. And it turns out they're of order 0.1 as opposed to in this figure, uh, the chemical potential is, 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 is of order one of the lepton asymmetry uh, number. So if you see here, the lepton asymmetries that were allowed in, back in 2000, 2002, even prior to the synchronization work, um, they were very large. They were tens. Uh, okay, okay. And then the CMB came around at about the same time in 2000 and said that uh, 2001 or so, 2002, when uh, WMAP came out, and then there's some indication of the baryon density from CMB before then. Um, uh -huh. Then it kind of constrained you to these points, and then it gets, still it's of order one in the asymmetry. That's mm -hmm. and so I guess if you, if you, so basically is the issue that the lithium is low, and that's why the best fit point is away from zero zero uh yeah i think this was um that's a good question this may be because the helium was a little uh okay. a little low okay. um i can't yeah I, I i forget exactly what happened back then okay yeah, there's, there's another question in the chat, actually. yeah so there's a question if the neutrino if a neutrino passes a supermassive black hole, will there be a gravitational correction to its potential? Uh, there will, uh, but to its total, I mean, to its total energy as opposed to something going on with the uh, polarization, uh, you know, what, what, what the P vector, what this formulation does is, is look at what the difference in the potential is from uh, between two different neutrinos due to flavor okay. dependent things. So gravity so is that. not flavor dependent, at least I don't think we think it, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Yeah. Okay, okay. So maybe like the time dilation effects would change the rate of oscillation, but the, but it wouldn't 
give the, you a matter effect be, essentially. It would be different. It wouldn't be in the p vector. It wouldn't be in this formalism anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, there would be an effect, but it would be flavor independent. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't really see. Um, I don't really see any new questions. I think we should probably call it lunch break. Um, and um, thank Kev again for a really nice lecture.